And for those of you who are here, uh, just to let you know that uh, Canada COG is a part of a worldwide group of COG churches. Uh, and, uh, so uh, the churches are from uh, based in Australia, uh, in Malaysia, in Singapore, in UK, in USA, and also now in uh, Can uh, Canada, which we have been doing for some time. And um, we have local pastors that are trained to minister the word of God. And we praise God for all that God is doing. And we'll travel, and I'll be constantly traveling to all the different churches in time to come. And um, in all that God is doing. We praise God for all that God is doing here in uh, Canada. And uh, a lot of miracles. We have seen cancer heal. Uh, in the churches and the medical services, we have seen people receive new body parts uh, over even here uh, as you continue to walk with God and uh, grow in God. And we work with medical doctors all the time too. So uh, we are not like the extreme extreme who are against all manner of medical things. My own daughter is a medical doctor specializing in uh, radiotherapy now. Uh, my son-in-law, uh, who is a mixed-race um, uh, person who is married to my daughter, is a, a medical doctor also, and he specializes in surgery. Uh, and his father was also a doctor, a medical doctor. Uh, and uh, so even though we have a lot of visions, revelation, our approach has always been scientific. And uh, when someone is, uh, has a sickness and ailment, we always tell them to get the best medical attention. At the same time, we make prayers for them. And at the same time, when God has done a uh, work of healing their lives, we always encourage them to continue to still uh, check with the doctors so the doctors will verify the healing. On our website, we have um, uh, a, lot, a lot of healings that we have put on our website. And normally, uh, we would have put only the healings, and next time we'll collect all the healings that have been confirmed, diagnosed by doctors, and also we have medical medical certificate certifying that the healing is really true, and they've got no more symptoms of those things. On our website, uh, there's a section on miracles and, and healings God has done, and it has been so. And uh, there are some that are still in the process of getting uh, medical certification. So that's where we stand. We believe in all of the Bible, the doctrines that we believe in are placed in some of our uh, uh, creed and doctrinal statements. And at the same time, we do train believers here. And in your Canada church, uh, now you have also uh, two of the 12. And why would we wear the 12? We just follow the pattern that Jesus said to us that we train. Uh, in order to be the top 500 leadership uh, that will help to govern the church that we plant all over the world. And uh, so we also pray for them and uh, training them. And when the 12 with their spouse pray together, we also impart upon them the same spiritual authority. And you will continue to see healings of cancer, signs and wonders as they pray too. And uh, because the authority and the power that God has is distributed. Uh, and you have uh, some, uh, at least you got one to three. Three among you and uh, the spouses here and, uh, who have been trained uh, in Canada, you got three of the 12. Right, you might count is right at the moment, three. And then I would say three plus three because plus the wife. Uh, or the house, oh, sorry, for the husband too. Yes, oh God. The one of them is the opposite. Hallelujah. <laughs> And so we have male and female, neither male or female, as long as the person is called by the Lord, we recognize that. And uh, in, a, in a way, the things of God. Praise the Lord. And we thank God for all that He's doing. Thank God. Uh, and uh, since then, we thank God. God is on the floor, isn't it? And uh, I haven't forgotten, we stay up holding your daughter, Natalie, and uh, keep a report to us about how she's doing. God given you a wonderful miracle. I can see that your shoulders have been. Very good so far. You can see that it's level up. Huh? How God has done a wonderful work in your life, creating miracles and healing. And uh, that power and authority is available for each one of you too. Remember in John chapter 14, verse 12, 
that uh, the Bible speaks about uh, he who believes in me will do the works that I do and greater work than these. And that includes everyone in the ministry and everyone not in the ministry. So every one of you can continue to walk and work in the miraculous things and uh, ways of the Lord. And uh, so even though today is a Sunday service, um, I could pick up, uh, even as we are speaking here, that uh, over in this section here, uh, one of you had had a, uh, but because it's Sunday, we don't go so much in the miracle service, but we just pick up, so that after we can pray, and we can, some of the people here will pray. Um, and there's the abdominal pain uh, that comes to you from time to time, and you're always wondering, hey, am I having an appendix or not? But it goes off, and you, the panic leaves you. And it comes and goes. And um, so it is also linked to a condition that you have. Um, and this is a sister. And it's a, a wound condition that you also have. We'll pray for you. Whatever you need, and you see the presence of God here, God is able to do a mighty work in each one of your life and establish here. And uh, there is a power and healing and all things that, that is always present when we gather. Uh, almost every Sunday you can pray, and like the Bible says, if anyone is sick, let them anoint with oil. And you will continue to see signs and wonders even after we go forth. Because we leave behind uh, people who are anointed, and that is God uh, continues to work in uh, each one of your lives. I'm picking up something that you can see uh, there's something. But let me get into the work that God wants to do and preach. Uh, but also mind you that uh, this, uh, I think Monday night is a regular Bible study. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And uh, you can come with any Bible question. So we will have Q&A, question and answer. And uh, you can come with any question, questions and answers in, uh, in the Bible. And also connected to the Bible or connected to Christianity. And we will do our best to give you an answer. So remember this week is Bible study, and we are prepared to answer any questions you have. And, um, and the most complicated questions you have, please do bring them and ask them. And we will seek our best to bring it for an understanding to the Bible. Uh, the reason being is that uh, after we teach, teaching is one of the most important things uh, that we have to do in the church. The miracles of God, the things of God, do not work by accident. They work because we understand the principles of God. They are what we call the laws of the Spirit. And uh, by the law of the Spirit, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 3, we are set from the, free from the spirit of sin and death. Sin and death include all manner of sicknesses and diseases. So by the law of the Spirit, the phrase that the Bible calls them laws, tell us there is a set principle. And anyone, anywhere in the whole wide world applying this principle should receive the same result. The same result. Because God doesn't practice favoritism. Anyone, anywhere, any age, any culture who practice the same principles will have the same result. Because it's a law. The law of God. The law of the Spirit. And the only thing is we love to teach uh, some of the laws of God. They've given some mathematical equations and all that, how to walk into open regions, how to do different things, and they're all free on the website. We provide them free because, because we believe that is the principle of Jesus. Our standards are very high. We lay ourselves based on the principles of Jesus and the Bible to practice the ministry, and uh, every sermon, and every teaching, Jesus gave it free. Imagine if Jesus said, hey, you can only hear my sermon if you sign up for a seminar. Something like that. Now Jesus gave all his sermons free. Same like the Apostle Paul. He even worked and, and, and uh, sometimes as a pen maker in order to make the sermons free for people. Because they have to set people free. And then when people are blessed, then they were blessed. Uh, people need uh, the messages of God. That's what we have done also online. And, uh, so we praise God for the local leadership here. And in Canada, we have planned many, many churches. In fact, uh, our next project after setting up 
this main churches but we don't we, we actually planning for ten main main churches throughout the world. And our next project uh, which uh, will be in 2017 and 2018, we will go to most of the main ministries in Canada and the USA and uh, and minister to all the uh, wherever they open doors. And we haven't got I got many invitations to go and minister to many churches. In the past I always turned them down because the time has not yet come. But in 2017 and 2018, we'll be going forth and then we'll be uh, uh, creating a wave that will bring you back to the local church uh, as people begin to hear the message. That's what I have. Uh, and so, if you remember, we have been teaching in a series. There's a different series on Friday night, there's a different series on a Bible study, the start of the series on Bible study, and uh, even including question and answers. A different series on Sunday, a different series, a <coughs> uh, different time, different series on uh, the miracle service last week. We all have different services and different messages. And if you remember what the series was, we have two Sundays here, last Sunday, this Sunday, and the series was on church growth. Church growth. We, we have a, a whole series on church growth that I taught uh, many years ago. Many of the churches uh, that are huge in Asia had some impact from our ministry. In fact, uh, uh, we helped uh, some of, train some of the leaders in the early days. And some of the main churches in Singapore, there are, there are mega churches today. Uh, we had some impact on the leaders. In fact, some of the churches we helped personally. And, uh, and the reason we touch on church growth principles is this. Church growth principles are also laws and principles of how churches grow. And the principle we teach, if applied to any church anywhere, will cause a church to grow. Now, church growth is different from special visitation, special revival, special outpouring, which is on top of the church growth. And so, normal churches could grow as they should, because this is a Bible principle. And, and here's the thing. We know we can that numerical growth, that is, Natural growth, adding numbers to a church, need not mean that people actually grow spiritually. Because there are many, many big churches, and the people are very shallow. You ask them about the Bible, you ask them about the spiritual principles, they don't know much. Because as a tradition, Christianity has already been established for 2,000 years. There are many denominations that come forth, many traditional churches that existed and sometimes three, four generations that attended church. The grandfather attended church, the father attended church, and uh, so the children attended church. It's a tradition. Even sometimes in tribal regions in Asia, there are two, three generations of Christianity. And so it's a habit for people to go to church. It's a custom and it's part of the culture now. And uh, Christian culture is absorbed. So there are many, many churches that grow uh, in different extent, and you will find that within those churches that grow, some of these principles are being practiced without people knowing. These principles will explain to you why churches grow anywhere, and also it will help those churches that are spiritual to grow. And so, it is possible that even though all churches and all groups of Christians, uh, we're talking about every denomination, they will grow, uh, and they are based on this, some of these principles, whether they know it or not. Sometimes they practice the principles without knowing, because we inherit them. And uh, natural growth does not always produce spiritual growth. That's what we know. It's just like you can give without love, but you cannot love without giving. One will produce the other, but the other doesn't, doesn't as it produce the same spiritual impact. However, we are not developing churches and people that are so vertical and spiritual that they don't know the horizontal relationship. Because there's the other principle. Because there's some churches that want to keep themselves secluded, secretive, and very, very mystical. 
everyone in Wild Eye and the leader might be cloth in camel's hair with wild hair, wild bushy eyebrows, nothing wrong with bushy eyebrows, <laughs> and wild screechy voice preaching. And then everyone like that. And we wonder whether it's a sack or a cup. We're not producing that either. All our leadership is based on the board members and accountability to one another, including myself. We are accountable and answerable to all our leaders. They can question me in any personal area or any public area as a group, as a leadership group. We are all accountable to one another. But here's the thing. Spiritual growth must produce natural growth. There is no such thing as, I'm growing spiritually, oh yeah, I'm growing spiritually, oh yeah. And everyone in the church grows spiritually, oh we are all so spiritual. Can you see the way we walk, we are so anointed, oh we are all so spiritual. And then the church exists for years and never grow naturally. No new member at that, nothing. So we say, what kind of spiritual growth are they actually getting? True spiritual growth will cause natural growth. That's the principle that we must realize. So there's no such thing as some mystical growth and that in God that has no impact on the people around us. It will have to impact your family. It will impact your friends and the circle of influence that is your life. All true spiritual growth will cause natural growth. So there is no such thing as a truly spiritual church that walks with Christ and doesn't grow either. Naturally in numbers. Now again I mentioned, numbers alone are not the thing. They might not produce spiritual growth. Because you can do a lot of things. Once you reach critical mass, and usually when a group is about 500 or 1,000, if they do the right things, they will maintain the number, or they will grow by biological growth. That means you can tell the group how many babies are born each year. Minimum. Or accidentally, they catch on the principle, but they need not be growing spiritually. Because... People love people. And people love to be part of something. But it need not produce. That's why I say, you can give without loving, First Corinthians 13, but you cannot love without giving. A place can grow naturally because people work hard. And they do their best to try to keep growing. And follow some principles to grow. And some of the principles we talk on, like fame, community, impact, everything. If you do things that co impact the community, you will grow naturally. And that's one of the principles we taught last week. But it did not grow spiritually. However, spiritual growth, true spiritual growth, will always result in natural growth. So there's no room for wild, sec uh, secluded people who claim to be spiritual but have no impact on your own family or your community. Because if you truly know God, the love that is in your life, the power that is in your life, the relationship that is in your life will impact your, your, your spouse, your family, your, your parents, your children, and all your friends. If it's truly spiritual growth. Which means one is a subset of the other. So the subset doesn't produce that, but that which is above produces the other. That we know. Now if you remember, last week we covered three points. <coughs> Some of you know around. As I said, even though we teach in a series, you can come at any point and we will do a big revision and then bring you forth so you won't be at a loss. Last week we taught on three points. I wonder whether you remember the three points. <coughs> Three things that cause spiritual growth, uh, or rather spiritual and natural growth in the church. Number one, the anointing of the leaders. That is, the anointing 
on the relationship of the leaders with God, with Jesus Christ. So if a leader is, has their own experience and anointing with God, so they grow in their anointing, and if the leader has an anointing over 100 people, if they start with 10, it will grow to 100. And if the leader has an anointing for 100 people, and they go and try to pastor a church that has 1,000 people, people will run away, pa, 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 under left 100, and then stop. Because every leader has an anointing capacity. Now, we need not be stuck. You can grow from being an anointed leader to 50, to 100, to 1,000. Remember, David was appointed captain over 1,000 after he slain Goliath. So, the anointing grows. So, every leader must grow. And every place must have the right leader or group of leaders in order to grow. And if you have a person with anointing, <coughs> anointing includes skills and that, it would be just, they just know what to do. Because anointing. If you have a person with anointing for 1,000 people, you put a person in a place with 100 people, somehow or other it will grow to 1,000. Now that applies in the business world also, because I know some of you in the business world. There is also an anointing for business. And you can get that anointing from God. And sometimes you get the anointing by association. That means a person with an anointing for 100, keep on learning from someone with an anointing for 1,000, it will not on. Correct? Same like in the business world. Someone with an anointing to handle a business that has a turnover of 200,000. Then, you learn the skills of how to have an anointing to have a business to turn over 1 million. Because there will be ideas, methods, and some sort of oom. Right? We can sometimes don't know how to describe anointing. The oom is there to make the business become a million dollar business. Can you imagine McDonald's was started by some, some guy who, 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 who loves burgers. Don't know whether they love burgers, but he, he does burgers. Somebody with a capacity to think in a million took that business and make it into a multi-billion business. So it applies in the ministry, it applies in the business world. Some of you might have ideas that actually could impact a million or billion people, but you don't have the anointing in business to bring it to the million dollar business because your anointing was a few thousand. So from your little home, you make a few thousand here and there. But the day you rub shoulders with and the anointing rubs on you, or you got directly from God, the anointing for a million, suddenly your business grows. So same principle in ministry, same principle in business. This is interesting. These are all laws. That is why businessmen like to attend. They, they don't realize it. Why they want to attend a business to make them more successful. We call that the um or anointing factor. That somehow if they can catch the secret on what this person is doing that can make this business grow from 100,000 to a million dollar business to a hundred million dollar business, that somehow the skill will rub on us and we get the anointing or the um and then it picks up. Can you see that? Of course, part of that in the world they call that marketing. We call that in point two, impact and fame on community. See, same principle. So that is why Paul went from, from synagogue to synagogue. You got to go to the community. For Paul, all that he knew was the synagogues that he learned from. And we show that uh, in the Bible, uh, the second point, just a revision, the second point was in the book of Acts, they grew to 3,000. In uh, Acts chapter 3, they grew to 5,000 because of the impact on the community. In Acts 3, it was an impact of miracles. So the community heard about it and said, Wow, we know this man. Now he's healed. 
we want to find out more. And so, 2,000 people were added to the church. The church became 5,000 strong. In both Acts, I'm quoting both Acts. In Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit came down upon them for the first time, they happened to have an international conference called Pentecost. So all people were there. And they saw something happen to the 120. At first they said, this looks like drunken people. Peter stood up and said, we're not drunken. This is the Holy Spirit. So they had an impact, an immediate, instant impact on the community. 3,000 were saved that day. So that is what I call community impact. Whether it be through signs of wonders or whatever, which is what we are trying to do to help the local church. In the year 2017 and 2018, we will go to all the major TV, radio and big ministries there and preach this message. Then work will get out. Because it has something to do with fame and community impact. It applies to business too. Correct. You might have some secret formula that some of you had that you inherit from your great-grandmother to your mother, to you. See, what's that formula? Yo, the herbal formula that you got from secret recipes from Africa that the world in the West hasn't seen before. When you apply it every day, oh, grandmothers look like teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been passing on the secret. But the world hasn't known. And then you manage to cook it up in your laboratory, in your kitchen. And all your close friends have that. And people get word my mom say, Hey, why your grandma look like a teenager? And you also, are you all having super genes? They're not our genes. We have this formula. Ah, and who knows? So one day it gets marketed. And then the world hears about that. And I'm learning about your culture. Some interesting things. Hallelujah. I only just learned today the different styles that you all go your hair through. <laughs> because I'm born with straight hair, I had never know what it's like to live with curly hair. And so sometimes I ask questions. I ask G, uh, Gmail and say, you know, when your hair grows out, what does it look like? Does it go long, shaggy, you know, like a dog? And always it goes up. It's like waves. <laughs> and 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 what will happen if a person with curly hair is called to be a Nazar Nazarite? You know what Nazarite is? Not allowed to cut their hair for the rest of your lives. I sing. I got good friends who are sing. You ever seen a sing? Uh, the sing are those who traditionally wear turbans. In Malaysia, Asia, we have them. And as a culture, they know the men don't cut their hair really long. And one day, it's my good friend in the ministry, he came to Christ, and he still doesn't cut his hair. There's some modern things that cut your hair. Uh, and so, and, and so, uh, the, okay, here's the thing, I don't know why you're lost here. Uh, is it a requirement to wear helmets here, right? Yeah. Yeah. And in Asia, it's the same thing. So, when they came up with helmet laws, the people whose name, surnames are Singh who normally have turban, they manage a special privilege. Because they have turban, no need to wear helmet. <laughs> Is it the same? Yeah. Oh, what's so special? I think, I think the turban was as good as a helmet. <laughs> oh, I, but here's what they say. Uh, in those days when they were discussing, they say, even if you invent a helmet big enough to contain a turban, they still won't wear it. <laughs> so they were given exceptions. But that was interesting. But, uh, and then once a month or so, he washes his hair. So sometimes I see him in his informal thing, and he has it, whoa, his hair. Because he's like, I a right, never cut his hair really long. And it takes uh, once a month to wash your hair. Uh, and so I can imagine, wow, you know. What happens if you have Afro hairstyle and you are a Nazarite? Oof! <laughs> I, I assume it grows sideways, right? So maybe I need to experiment with one of you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they say, hey, could you please 
keep, keep, keep your, your, your hands. I want to see the impact of it. You know, uh, what happened after 20 years at least, you know? See whether at some stage it will come down. Is it one? Wow, it is anti gravity. <laughs> Perhaps there's something we have discovered. Anyway, so anyway, that's interesting in, in all the different things. But uh, there is a point too about impact to the community that causes growth, all your business to grow. You might have a fantastic business, but nobody knows you. You still won't succeed because you have that impact on the community. The world uses advertising to do that. We depend on God in word of mouth. But sometimes you need to do a little bit of advertising, not too much. Just so you get the word out there, hey, we are here. So people at least know your address and where you are. Uh, and, uh, so you don't expect everybody to pray that the Lord said, okay, this is an address. Harun Tario Street. You don't expect them to you know, uh, know that. But I think your street is interesting. I think your street here, is, I saw the street, street name, you know, Slow or Slough Street. And you turn, you know, go to Slough Street <laughs> or whatever. But anyway, second point that we touched on last week was community impact. It applies in business, it applies in the church. You have to have community impact. I only say the principle, how you do it is also important. Don't do the wrong thing to try to impact. You must also learn that methodology has to be led by the Spirit and wisdom inside. Then you remember the third point I mentioned that it is based, any big church has leaders inside. Captains of 50, captains of 10, captains of 100. So in a church of 1,000, you might have you might have 10 captains of 100 or 20 captains of 50, or 10, uh, or 10 captain, uh, 20 captains of 50, and 10 captains of 100. So you might have a mixture of that, or some captains of 10. Because when you, a church grows to about 250, 350 people, even if you visit everybody once, it takes one year to cover everyone, if you visit every day. So when it's in the thousands, there's no possible way the main pastor can visit everyone. Because everyone's circle has 24 hours. How much time we have, how much can we do? So you're dependent on the captains. And each captain visits their people and very close to the people. It's a natural thing. You don't have to prevent clicks in church. Clicks are natural. Because people need to relate to someone close. And one of the reasons why churches grow is because people feel a belonging. My friends are there. My families are there. And they might visit every other place, but they always come back to where the friends are. Somewhere where they feel connected. So there is this principle of the captains. And I preached that last week saying that if any church wants to grow, the main leaders must not be insecure. So you know why many churches stop at 100, 150 and never grow further? Because every time another captain comes and the main leader only is a captain of 100, 150, another captain of 100 comes. If you learn to work together, they could have grown to 250, correct? And, but he's threatened, insecure, so keep pushing them out. So the church grow a bit, divide, grow a bit, divide, grow a bit, divide, grow a bit, quarrel, then cannot work together. Because to work together, you must have a big heart. You must be generous. Now, that also applies to business. You know how businesses can go to the millions? Because they got captains coming in. Maybe a salesman is a captain of 100. Or they, someone comes in. For example, suddenly your business and your product gets known by a famous actress. Then everybody know. Actress, let me give, I don't give a name. So, X, why is that? Use your product. Oh, suddenly everybody want to use your product. See what happened. Because the actress has a natural captain and influence on the community over thousand. So everyone has a circle of influence. Some have more, some have less. 
when the captains know your product, bang, it moves. But you sometimes have to work hard to win one captain. Right? You have to work very hard. Uh, I actually invented a game when I first migrated to Australia because I, I was I had to go into the business to migrate as a, in a business dimension when I became uh, uh, migrated to Australia. I invented a board game. The board game is how green oh, I may change the, uh, the, the things sometimes. But it's a it's a it's a board game that is better than Monopoly. In Monopoly, you buy streets, you build houses, build hotels, and then you tax and then you win. Right? And you must collect three sets of the same color to start building. Wow. Yeah. Basic principles of Monopoly. In my game, you buy countries. So there are certain countries in the world and you can adapt to each, each place to make sure the country is there. You buy countries, you develop the countries. You build roads, you build airports, and there are little things that represent roads, airports, and then uh, you build trains, and then you must plant trees to balance the environment, and then uh, it has international currency because it's all the world. Plus, it has four currency. European currency, American currency, Asian currency, African dollar. Then as the grain progresses, it I copyright it now. So somebody here trying to do that re copyright, sorry, you know. <laughs> and now uh, and and so we produce the game in Australia. And um, then uh, we had a turnover to 250,000. And uh, so we was marketing the game. So as a as a section developed they got currency inflation. So the international currency will remain the same, but the local currency will catch up one to one. Two to one, three to one. And I have a computer version in my head that I haven't done it yet, no time to do it, that it will progress by 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, like the real world. And um, so I marketed the game, and I had to for two, two, three years in order to gain my citizenship, uh, become PR in citizenship, you have to turn over, employ several, Australians and, and other I'm Australian citizens now. And, um, so, when I was marketing my game, I found that the world was dominated by two players. The world, the game world, and not, not the Asian side, the board game world. One was Parker Brothers, and the other, I forgot the other company, big company. And I, I, I no, in the whole world, they control all the games, they buy up all the copyright. And then I realized, wow, we're a small player here. Then uh, I knew that I could try to market to them, but it would take a long time. Say so it's hard work trying to market. So I did my own marketing, got the Australian government on board to help me to export and all those things. And um, I could produce it cheap in China, but I had to do it as an Australian product in order to promote Australia. And, um, so we did it for three years. Once I got my PR, then because I was more interested in the ministry. So I went into the ministry, and then that is in my back burner. But I keep all my copyrights, and all my prototype and everything. So that, uh, you know, it's already done, so it's copyrighted, no one can do it. But I hold the copyright. But I could have easily sold the copyright, and then lost it. And do you know that Monopoly was set, sold for less than $1,000 or $10,000? It's making million. So they just want to buy you lock, stock, barrel. So when you have a product, sometimes, you know, there are all these barriers. And it takes hard work. It took hard, because it's so much hard work, that's why I say either I'm in that line or I'm in the ministry. I couldn't do both. And uh, so at some time, I was helping different churches. I, I work part time, and uh, so I, I did the computer industry, and uh, I, I organized, and uh, I could put the computer together, tie it apart, program the whole thing, do networking, and all those. So that was a good enough thing. So I left the game industry because it takes a lot of work. You got to promote it in schools. You got to promote it to different places. You got to go to all the what I call game show and all that to display your product. And as long as you keep doing it, there's turnover. Uh, when we stop doing it, we'll see, we're going to keep following on the clients and all that. This is like the same principle of getting captains to promote your product. But once in a while, you get a few captains. 
sometimes like US, you know, we have some people interested, and then they don't buy the games by 50 or 100 kind of thing. That's like a captain, someone who has the same vision. So the same principle apply whether it be the church or to the ministry, except in the ministry we call it anointing. But it still needs the skills to relate to other captains. And, and be able to not be insecure. And in order to grow into a mega church, every local leader who is appointed must be trained not to be insecure. Then they will welcome and work with all the other captains. How do you think David took over the empire and the kingdom of Israel? He had 400 powerful people. That was his 400. Remember, they all started in a cave. Out of 400, you got 30 of them, the best of the best of the best. And they are so strong in character that at one time when their families were lost in Ziklag, they were thinking of killing David too. And these are the people who are strong characters, who are captains. Captains of thousands and tens of thousands. When David was captain over them, he could rule over the tens of thousands. So that when the rebellion took place under Absalom, Absalom's army was very frightened of David's army. Because his army was made of captains. Their army is untested. Mighty men. So as in the spiritual, so in the natural. Three points I touched on last week. Now we got new points this week. Okay, what are the additional points that we can learn uh, in order to grow a church? Knowing that if any church truly grows spiritually, you will grow naturally. These are all found in the Bible. See, the Bible is so practical and we can find and discover the keys that are inside. Ah, and, uh, so the fourth principle that we are looking at here in the Bible, uh, in terms of church growth, which it can apply to business growth or even professional growth. Even if you're not in the business, you're a professional person, you're always looking for more and more recognition. Or you might have a product or copyright or intellectual property that you have come up with. Same principle. Same principle can be applied to promote yourself. Why do some people get high paying jobs? Because they are in demand. Correct. Like, for example, not all architects are equal. They start equal. But some architects are more famous. So to employ them, you might have paid, their starting pay might be million to do a project. And they only touch projects that are hundreds of millions. How did they build such a reputation? Through time and effort. And once they become famous, they say, whoa, everybody wants them. Every big, giant project. See, if you got a hundred million dollar project, and you want to employ an architect, what would you have done? You will probably employ an architect who has a fantastic design background, correct? You wouldn't go down to the shop down the road in a ghetto. We want students who are just starting up, although the student could be more brilliant. Right? By nature, you go that direction. So, in the professional world, this principle also applies. You're, you attain fame skills and all those things and all these help the church to grow now while all these things are happening there is other principles that are very important the fourth principle in church growth as well as in the commercial growth or your professional growth is you actually must be enjoying yourself if your church is under pressure must grow must grow must grow must grow, must grow. Every Sunday the pastor preach. Grow! Grow! Why is he bring you people? Huh? Come on. Every Sunday they get flogged and beaten. And you're condemned, condemned, scared. Huh? Then one Sunday, he say, hey, why don't go to church? Go there and get scolded. <laughs> At home already, enough scolding. Go to work, scolding. Go to church, also scolding. So, nobody's enjoying church. If nobody enjoys church, it will never grow. So although we understand these principles in the background, and the same in the business, that 
if people perceive there's too much pressure, just your only goal is numerical growth. Or in the business, the only thing you're interested in is more, more people, more people, more people. And you become a very rude person. You know, have you seen sometimes, like in, even in Hong Kong, in some places, uh, people are so rude. All they want is more business. And you're just looking around and saying, you know, buy anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want you to run. You come in and buy. <laughs> Cannot look. <laughs> They're interested only money. Money, 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 money. But they forgot. If people enjoy themselves, people attract people. And uh, so it's just like the principle of when someone wrote in the commercial world that uh, one poor student, you know, he goes to this cafeteria because. Uh, the food is good and it's reasonable price. Let's say you can only afford like three dollars a lunch. He can't afford ten dollars lunch, so you go to this. And the person was so rude because he went faster or what? And the person forgot. This student comes every day and spend three dollars against somebody who comes and spend one ten dollars. In the long run, he actually spends more. And so, and then they forgot. If people like the place, they will bring their friends. If people hate the place, they will tell people, hey, don't go back there. The waiters are rude. The cook is rude. Even the doorkeeper is rude. The sign also is rude. Say, what sign? Say, don't come here unless you want to eat. Aha! <laughs> You go only one time, and that's your last, first and last time. There is a principle of everyone enjoying themselves. The same way, you know, like I'm preaching now. As I preach, I enjoy the ministry. You can tell if I'm not enjoying the ministry. Ah, God wants me to do this again. <sighs> you know, of people who come to church who don't enjoy church. Whether your church, and here's the advice, whether your church is a small church, 10 people, Make sure that then people enjoy themselves. Don't get them so highly tense. Let's grow. Pastor said, let's grow. In the next day, we don't grow something wrong with us. And you're so highly tense. Instead of growing, the people die one by one. <laughs> Nervous engine heart attack every year, one person. Five years, like five members. Six years, senior pastor himself died. <laughs> Too much under pressure. So, nobody's enjoying themselves. Now, even if it's a mega church, as we grow when we reach the thousands and tens of them, I have every confidence I can tell you right now. This church will be a mega church. Amen. Every church we plant. Because that is the where we came from. Amen. In fact, I don't quite I'm someone who don't quite enjoy fame. Don't quite like I like privacy. I was so famous at one time in, in, in Asia that I could go to any place and fill a stadium. I know what fame is like. Not quite so enjoyable. Some people enjoy it, I'm not one of those. You go to the supermarket, most everyone recognizes you. So when I make a mistake and I fell, and I, yes, it's all, I'm open and transparent about my past. I had to go to somewhere where nobody knows me for 10 years before I come back to the ministry. Yeah. Because and I didn't want to go to a place where everyone knows me. And uh, so, fame is interesting. And uh, so, we have here that even one day when we go to the thousands and tens of thousands and millions, let's not forget to enjoy each other. The fellowship, the friends. Because what's the, what's, what's the whole purpose of growing so big? And no more enjoy your home, your family, your friends. What actually are you working for? The same like any business, some of you business people, or your professional, you have to be more well known, more recognize your profession, earn more income, and, and, and more, and all that, achieve more. Or your, your business world, you have to earn more and more. What's the use of more money when you come back and you don't have a, a family to enjoy? Kids, parents, to take out, to enjoy. Right? These are the precious things. At the end of the day, these are very precious. You don't want to earn millions of dollars and come back to an empty home. 
the title of the home is Home Alone. <laughs> Minus all the human. And then you eat alone at a very expensive restaurant because you got so much money. But all alone. The restaurant you go to is Lone Ranger Restaurant. Your favorite? Tonto Steak. You know Lone Ranger is Tonto, right? And you don't have Tonto. So the closest you got to Tonto was a Tonto Steak. And there's no happiness. You can go to any beautiful place to visit, to tour, to have a holiday. But you don't know. Not nice. So remember the precious thing. Let me show you the Bible here in the book of uh, Acts, chapter 2. We always support with the Bible, all the principles. In Acts, chapter 2, they already have uh, 3,000 people at the end of the sermon. And you see in Acts, chapter 2, in verse 46, 47. So continuing daily, we want a court in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. See, they were enjoying themselves. Can you see the word gladness? Make people happy. And then it says, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. You know many Christians have peace. And generally Christians have love. But sometimes Christians don't have joy. And it's a joy that shows that you are satisfied. You're satisfied. I am uh, I love, you know, in Asia they express their joy very conservatively. Even sometimes when an uh, 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 Asian lady laugh, they laugh. <laughs> but is that the way they show happiness? <laughs> but when your culture rejoices, oh, Adunga, 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 <laughs> what was that? Adunga, Wakata, Seyesu, oh. Your joy really comes up. I love that. So that's why I told uh, Pastor Elijah when it comes to Singapore, please teach us the Adunga Adunga song. Because <laughs> they're expressing. And uh, uh, when your joy is there, your joy is there. And uh, so, an interesting thing, I don't know whether it's because your teeth are actually whiter. <laughs> but I tell you, you, you know, if we, we be off the lights at bright night, you will see your teeth smiling. <laughs> uh, if you tell the joy that is there, is in your life, and uh, I think actually now when looking at your teeth, your teeth actually whiter. <laughs> uh, so must be your genetics that is there, right? Unless you are using something special today. <laughs> so oh, maybe some African recipe, right? Uh -huh. For what? Uh huh. Wow! Okay, some product not marketing. Hallelujah. And so we have here that they really enjoy church. They really enjoy themselves. It's contagious in a good way. And in the business also, if you if you some businesses are harder than others. I think the food and beverage industry a lot hard work. But if you enjoy yourself doing whatever you enjoy, it catches on. Whether you're professional, make sure when you study, uh, young people, when you study, study to be a profession in the industry that you really enjoy. Because at the end of the day, it's not just earning money. You must enjoy what earning it. And, and no, no point, you know, say, well, this is the highest earning job. I want, I want, you're so nervous, tension. Then you've got the first pay, the second pay, third pay, fourth pay, go hospital. <laughs> so your hospital bill is as big as your income because you don't enjoy your job. Remember, a merry heart do a good, like a medicine. So whether it be business, professional life, church life, one must enjoy themselves. And the local person must enjoy himself with his people. And uh, so when they enjoy themselves, God added 
to the church. And always, even Paul says in Romans chapter 14, the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy. So if a church doesn't have righteousness, peace and joy, we are saying, is that really the kingdom of God? Because the Bible says the kingdom of God has righteousness, it has peace and it has joy. Romans 14. So, it is those things that you can show grow in any professional world. It's a fourth important principle of growth that is there. Why we teach this principle is because sometimes there are many churches that are truly spiritual. And once you, you come with us, you realize we are very spiritual people. We fast a lot, we pray a lot, we see visions, do all those things. But we enjoy them. And there are many churches and many people who are actually very spiritual. But the reason they are not growing or having impact on others, this also applies to your personal life. They have no impact on others is this. They are ignorant of this principle. Do you know all things have to be taught? All things have to be taught. Children go to school and we expect them to make friends. But there is no school course to show how to make friends. But everything can be broken down to a principle. We need to tell them, this is how you make good friends. And this is how you watch for friends that are not so good. This is how you choose your friend. Didn't the Bible say in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, it's important who you make friends with. But we don't have a course like that in school. So they must learn that from the parents. Or from the church. It is important. So if you have a youth service and a youth group, Probably some of the topics they need to cover is how to make friends and how to keep friends, how to choose the right friend. Or topics like how to choose the right profession. Say things that are important that are not taught. They only teach you mathematics, physics, chemistry, all those things. expect you to learn the other social things by yourself. And this is where the church functions. This is where we need to learn these things and in order to grow. And be kind of like so I'm saying, some people are genuinely spiritual, but they lack knowledge. Once they know what they should do and, and should, should also develop in, then they change. And so we have succeeded to a certain extent in attracting people who are very spiritual, but teach them that social life is as important based on the Bible. And so you got two things working at the same time. And uh, then you know the difference uh, between uh, uh, different churches and all those things. Uh, and uh, we always say that, you know, uh, in every church, uh, you, need, you need a front door and a back door, figuratively speaking. And you need, you need uh, uh, some, in some churches, their front door is big, but their back door is bigger. So, as many people go through the church but cannot stay, it just flows in and flows out. And in fact, the church seems to grow smaller, and then a bit bigger and smaller, and we never grow big. I've known churches from big grow to small. And so in, in Canberra, uh, uh, now I'm saying these principles will work, but sometimes it takes longer to get the principles to work. Depends on where. It's just like you plant a church in India, it's different from planting a church in Iran or planting a church in Saudi Arabia, or planting a church in America, or, and then different cities are different. So, in Canberra, it's one of the hard places where very, most of the churches are not big, and uh, it took, the biggest church took them 20 odd years to grow. And so, within five years, we had a church of 100 to 100 something people, 150, and then I pass it on, because I was going to do traveling ministry. The person who took it, didn't absorb this principle. The whole just he started. The first thing he started was to quarrel with the leaders, leaders that I love and work with for years, and they're good people, but they're strong people. So you need to know to respect and work with them. So once you quarrel with captains, what will captains do? They will leave. So once the captains start leaving, it was dwindled down to he was only captain to his own little tiny group, and then your other issues and all that. So he just didn't know how to continue to build the church. And it is important that 
we learn and some of these things are not easy to learn or it takes time to develop them. And, uh, so on this uh, principle on learning, principle number four, enjoying yourself, enjoying people, being welcoming. Uh, people can tell it has to be from the heart, very genuine. They really enjoy doing what you're doing. And then when you enjoy doing what you're doing, whether people come, they don't come, whether you really, sometimes you struggle for a while, you go to different periods and all that, you still learn to enjoy yourself in the Lord. And as long as you enjoy yourself, you know what happens? When you enjoy doing what you're doing, you could do it for the long haul and it doesn't affect you. Because it's something you enjoy. And there's great patience when it comes. Patience is easy when you have joy. And that's why tribulation, when Jesus says, be of good cheer. When you're good cheer, you can go through tribulation. Tribulation develops patience. Patience is easy and you continue to grow in you. So that's the four points, very important in order to grow into uh, in the ministry, in the church, in every area that God has. Now that also applies to personal ministry. When you go from church to church, God opens doors for you. There's skills in relating to that. There's skills in continuous. Because each open door can create many other open doors. As you know, when you in a business world, you get one client or customer, that client can bring other clients. But if you lose one client and you did things that are wrong and you lose a client, that client can also spread word and cost you other clients that you potentially could have but you will never have again. So there's this relational thing that people need to be taught. <coughs> and it's for the fourth point, how important it is to truly enjoy oneself and uh, have the blessing of God's growth. We are able to, at least in our time that we've given to us, bring a fifth point to this area that is also from the Bible in which um, it results in what I call a certain manner of uh, growth that God adds uh, <coughs> to the church that is there. But this fifth point, uh, let me read <coughs> um, from a different section of uh, the Bible. And um, let's read on from, um, okay. Let's uh, start with Acts chapter 6 first. Acts chapter 6, because sometimes there are several points of flow. In Acts chapter 6, it tells us here in verse um, 1 to 3. Now, in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Then they did the seven deacon things. I appoint them. Then look at verse 7. The word of God's prayer. And the number of disciples multiplied greatly, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were obedient to faith. This, we cover one of the points from here as a captain. But I like to see before the captains came. The fifth point is, you must be a problem solver. Every business will have problems. Every professional life will have problems. Every church will will have problem. The difference between a church that can grow to a mega church and a church that never grow is that the leaders are not skillful to solve problems. It is not because they don't have problem. Oh, the church never had problem, that's why it grew to a thousand. You know that's not true. You cannot say, oh, the business grew to from a, a, a a small business of two, three hundred thousand per annum to millions of dollars, and they have no problem. No such thing. Correct? You know that's not real and not true. And he said, Oh, that professional architect is so famous now. It costs millions to employ him. He's been there for 20 years. Remember, he also started as a student. Everybody starts the same place. Why is it that you can have a university graduate a hundred people? 
let's say architects, they all go out. At the end of 10 years, some are more famous than others. Some are more effective. Not always because they are smarter, not always because they are more skillful and more talented, but many times because they know this principle. They know to relate to people. Even you yourself, if you have a business right now and you're looking for a top manager to grow a new branch, would you find someone who is so smart, so skillful, but who don't know how to relate to people? Or someone who is less smart, less skillful, but can learn? Well, very good relationship. You would choose the second person. So again, I say, it's not just skill, but talent and ability. And you know why? Some people can only solve problems that are non-people problems. You leave them alone, they know how to diagnose a car. And they are called lone ranger people. They are like the technician who rather solve computer problems than people problems. And these people, I can guarantee you, they will be very good at their job, but they will never be the one who get promoted. The one who get promoted will be the one who is good at their job and good at relating to everybody. Now, there's a wrong thing also. Don't overdo it. You don't relate to people just for promotion. So you are like, you are like, uh, we call that in Asia the tripod. You know, you're always exaggerating and um, uh, um, what I call trying to win favors. It's so insincere. Just be yourself. But still, there need to be a skill in doing that. There need to be something natural. If you haven't learned, you're going to start learning. And you have to learn to get along with your boss or your employer, whether easy or not. Because if your employee is your employer, obviously, if you're being employed, that person probably is ahead of you. Otherwise, you'll be employing him. That person must have learned something to be where they are in life. So learn from them. Even they're hard to get along. And it's not perfect people that succeed. Some of the big industry people are not perfect people. But there are some things that make them who they are today. Nothing happens by accident. Understand it. Whether natural or spiritual, world, nothing happens by accident. There's some things that they must have. You can learn from that. And so it, when I talk about problem solving, it's twofold. You must be able to solve problems within the technical area. That means you know, you know how to solve. That means problems that don't relate to human beings. For example, you will be able to solve problems of, for example, how to learn how to pray deeply. How to, uh, these are spiritually technical things, how to have visions in God, how to hear God. These are technical things that you have to learn how to hear God so that you're going to find a place for God, how to walk according to the faith level, how to help someone that are, uh, you know, skills in helping them. This is all technical thing. You have to solve technical problems or spiritually technical problems. But you must also be able to solve people problems. As long as you have a group of people, people are different level and they won't get along. Here you see two groups of people. The Hebrews and the Hellenists don't get along. And of all things, these are all widows. In the Bible time, most of the widows are all widows. You know what widows are? Husbands die. And at that time, the Greek language was more popular. But these are Hebrew widows speaking Hebrew. Some Hebrew widows who are probably the younger ones, who are you know, educated who speak the Greek. And they say there was a complaint. Now, you don't realize how many widows there are. Okay, just take a sample. The church grew, this is Acts chapter 6. The church grew to about um, 3,000 on Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 3, it says the number came to 5,000. Then it says God added daily. So if the daily multiply them by 2, then you will have actually uh, 10,000. And then, if it's multiplied by three, knowing the impact of the signs and wonders, don't forget, in Acts 5, shadow healing took place. People in the community bring the sick and Peter's shadow could heal. 
Can you imagine? They might be by that time 50,000 strong. By X6, the widows, a 50,000 member church, generally might have nearly 1,000 widows. You know, when your church is big, you, you, a lot of things are happening all the time. And uh, in fact, uh, when our church grew in Asia, uh, we have a full-time pastor to take care of marriages and funerals. If your church is one million strong, most likely every other week somebody dies. And you might have a full-time pastor to just do funerals. Of course, we're talking about glory church, so almost nobody dies. Uh, that's good. But uh, everybody can hear. But in general, people do grow old and go home. Or people's time are finished and they go home. So imagine, full-time pastor taking a funeral service every week. Hmm. Every week is crying, hmm. sorrow, praying, comforting, every week. You know, that is a bit too much. Uh, because although when you go home, because it's supposed to be cheerful too, but generally there's some, some sorrow. So, every three years that pastor also die of heartbroken. Okay, so, so if you ever have a full-time pastor taking a funeral service, make sure the pastor also do marriages. So, he says, says, happy. Then baby dedication. Uh, hey, we are supposed to have baby dedication. Uh, we're going to call the baby. You're like, okay, okay, can call the baby dedication. Okay. Yeah, today we have baby dedication. Ah, hallelujah. Happy occasion, isn't it? Like nobody sees a baby and say, oh dear, dear, dear. <laughs> happy occasion. So make sure the full time pastor, next time we have millions of members, make sure the full, the full time pastor take care of funeral service. Must also, your China church will already have millions of members. And uh, so the full time pastor take care of funeral service, also do the joyful stuff. Hallelujah. Yeah. And uh, praise the Lord. And uh, When you have 500 to 1,000 widows complaining, that's a big problem. And they're complaining, the most simple thing. What do you think? The Bible never leaves out the complaining. Why is my foot too slow? Apostle Peter, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor Peter was running, serving. Oh, oh, serving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming, my dear, coming. Ah, yeah. And he said, hey, we cannot be doing this all the time. We need time for prayer. So the widows will be, you know, asking a word, hey, today's food not like yesterday. What happened to the cook? Mom? Why, why is it so Hellenistic? I want my old Hebrew style. Oh! All manner of complaint. Do you know when you have 1,000 people complain, it sounds almost like a storm. Have you gone to the airport or there people talking? Can you imagine when whenever they go to the area where all the videos are taken care, when the problem was great, they go and they come back and head start all different. Oh, tough. And Peter, let's appoint seven people. And then you say the point. Uh, just joking, eh? He said, any volunteers, boom, nobody is about. <laughs> said, okay, let's choose seven people who are full of the Holy Ghost. So you send someone baptized with fire, Holy Ghost, anointing. He goes, inside go, and they go, hallelujah. All the people, huh? 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 Okay. Hallelujah. Anyway, solving people problems. It's a skill. <coughs> as long as you are human beings, you will have relational, relationship thrive. Sometimes, it is just our petty things, simple things. But is it important? To learn how to solve them. <coughs> Without that, churches, businesses, you know how many businesses I've seen, Christian businesses, <coughs> who started with a pure heart. I've seen some real estate companies, they, they start new in Malaysia. Uh, I mean, these are young entrepreneurs. And they say, we want to give to the Lord. <coughs> we believe in the kingdom. <coughs> kingdom business. 
and they were good. <coughs> when they started, <coughs> it was when they started, it was just a few hundred thousand, which was good. Take care of two of them, some employee. <coughs> When they hit their first million, and million is split. Money costs problem. It's not money that costs problem. The people with different values of money <coughs> allow money to change them. <coughs> Fame can change some people. Money can change people. It's people that change. <coughs> the money was always there. Potential for fame was always there. We need to handle people, whether commercial world or in the church, or in any other dimension of professional life. Some professionals never get into good companies or, or get higher and higher. Opportunities like because they don't know how to relate to people. They couldn't handle and <coughs> stay by themselves. Who will make you in charge of a group of other architects? You become a senior architect over others. If you cannot handle people, all you can handle is the plan. Say, I don't want you to talk to me, just that. You cannot handle people. You can never grow. Can never rise up. I know you can tell me stories of people who are rude, who are abrasive, and all those things, but that is, don't look at those things as the main points and make them who they are. Those things are things people tolerate because there are other things that people are attracted to. So don't use the negative to try to accentuate the positive result. I know that. There are different places, different churches with good people with imperfections. Even the commercial world, highly successful people, good people, they are skilled in some areas but not skilled in other areas. In the end, those people will still have the ability to manage people. Maybe people of a certain type that will attract to them and they can manage where these people find something under them. Now, wasn't David a good people person? David could manage the mighty man. Nobody could manage the mighty man. There were people who came to him in a cave, who were in debt, who were distressed. Then distressed people not easy to handle. And they were discontented. Discontented, unhappy people. And he made them a merry band of 400 people. Hallelujah. We call a name Robin Hood. I say he didn't rob the poor and give the uh, rob the rich and give the poor. He was just a captain over them. In Adulam King, you read about him in the Bible. So he banded together this group of people. He had people skill. Later on, you see how he handled his relationship with Saul. He behaved wisely. And then you see how he handled uh, Edna. And all these things, relationship skills, and the ability to solve human problems. The church, after that, grew mightily and it multiplied more and more. Jesus, our Lord, had the ability to handle 12 disciples of which one betrayed him, 12 with different personalities. Yet he loved them, established them, and helped them to grow. There are all these skills that we need in order to grow in life. And the wonderful news is that God can help us and give us these things. Even if you're born without it, even if your education never trained you in those areas, these can be acquired and taught. Some things are caught, some things are taught. These can be caught and taught. Praise the Lord. Let's pray and we will dedicate our Alicia.
Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your love, for your mercy upon our lives. We thank you, Father, for this church that you established. Thank you for what you call us to be and to do. Father, we recognize that your perfect will is all that we desire. All we ever want. And we love you. I sing that song, I love you alone. And I leave my voice. Let's all rise together. And then after we sing that song, we'll call uh, baby forward to them. Let's uh, bring uh, baby Alicia. And we're going to dedicate the baby to the Lord. And I read one passage. The good thing about the Bible is that the, Jew, the Jewish people have a tradition of like baby dedication, especially the males on the, um, during the time that they're brought to the temple. And I'd like to read from 2 Timothy chapter 1. And the reason for baby dedication is what we call impartation. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says to Timothy in verse 5, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwell first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I'm persuaded is also in you. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. God has not given us a spirit of fear, of power, of love, of a sound. And so we all the grandparents and all the, the godfather and godmothers, the parents are here. We're gonna pray over Elysia. And hello, let's bring her forward. Now and, and sometimes when we dedicate baby, we release a word of prophecy and all that. And they say pray, we pray for the impartation spiritually upon Alicia. Alicia. And uh, in that, uh, that all the goodness of the grandparents and uh, all of the parents will be upon Alicia. And a spiritual heritage that is that. And the strength that is imparted. Plus additional things that God will release upon Alicia. So I will welcome each one of you. Stretch all your hands and bless Alicia. And we can be together with uh, Alicia. Hello. And uh, let's bless Alicia. Alle Mara Syria, Nenegabala Boshi. La Hanga Malay, Kandubongani. Nala Hanga Ling, Alamoshia, Nala Manga Brasta. Elenia Hanga Lamonga Malia, Tiria Shiata. Oh, Father God, we impart the gift of music, the gift of worship, and all the gifting that will enhance at least here to be a part of 24 hour worship. We also impart upon her as she inherit the prophetic gifts from her parents and from the steadfastness of, of love of Jesus, steadfastness to church, loyalty to Jesus, that is then the grandparents to also be upon Alicia. Thank you, Father God, for the spirit of faith that is in her life to her grandparents and to the parents. And we thank you for all that you give her. And we ask of God, as the Spirit has chosen these parents, and the Spirit has chosen to come at this time, that all the fullness of the life of the Spirit, the gifting of God, and the gifts in the DNA will be awakened. So besides the gift of music, besides the Lord, the prophetic gift that she has inherited, and also the gift of faith, and genuine faith that she has received, we thank you, Father God, that she has a heart of pure love. And people will see the purity of her life. And the purity will come forth. And that this purity will be like those who receive. 
in a generation to see the rapture. That the, the glory of Christ, fullness of Christ will be reflected through her perfectly as a symbol in this church and of all the younger generation. Thank you, Father, for all your blessings and impartation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I tell you, that's the cutest little earrings I've ever seen. <laughs> And I suddenly see little babies with earrings. This is the cutest little earrings I've ever seen. Amen. In our, in, in our days, they don't kiss their ears that fast. She is one fast one. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's all love. Uh, can you worship the Lord with a word, song, I love you. And if any one of you have any areas that we just want to quickly pray for you, any ailment, sickness, we do not want anyone you can leave without prayer. And uh, if you have those uh, symptoms, come forward and we'll pray for you. If you want privacy, we won't speak about it to anyone. Or we'll just pray for you as you sing a song, I love you Lord. Or you can come after the service afterwards. I love you Lord.
thank you, we give a praise, we give a glory, we worship your majesty. For nothing can do such beauty but you. In your beauty of holiness, you've given us life. You've given us glory. That daddy in this world on the earth there is none that has been glorified more than man. And it's because of your wish and of your love for us. This morning you've expressed towards us that same love. And you've purified us in our spirits, in our souls and in our bodies. The sicknesses have been taken out. The weaknesses have been taken out. That we've been renewed and been restored in you. We say thank you. We thank you for all the blessings you've bestowed upon us. We thank you, Lord. That in our gathering, your word has proven to us that you've shamed the devil on our behalf. And for that reason, we have been made more than conquerors in you. We say thank you. Thank you for giving us principles, not only that governs our church growth, but also that governs personal growth. We say thank you. That as we abide by these principles, we know definitely that our lives will touch others and they will come to know you. We pray my thinking. Committing our families and our friends that are not here into your care. That as we've received from you, so do we bless them. That the eyes of their understanding will be enlightened. And they will come to know you and love you more. We pray that we don't leave this place without your presence. But that your presence go with us. And you teach us even deeper things about yourself and in you. That we will love you. We thank you, mighty King. We bless you in Jesus' name we pray thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Amen.